everyone joining us today and thank you for tuning in. I am Dr. Moal Kalap, a research fellow here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and I am back as your host for today's episode of Beast Research Radio, a YouTube channel and podcast produced by the Bioengineering and Therapeutic Solutions Lab at the Heart Institute. Our goal at Beats Research Radio is to communicate science to the community. Our guest today is Dr. Nabil Seda. Dr. Seda is the director of the Biochemical Neuroendocrinology Research Unit and full research professor at the Institut de Recherche Clinique de Montréal, as well as Université de Montréal, and adjunct professor at McGill University in the Department of Medicine. He holds a Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in Precursor Proteolysis and has amassed numerous distinguished awards in the fields of science and research over his still thriving career. Among the many research studies tackled, Dr. Saida's group is aiming to explore the clinical implications of proprotein convertases in disease states, such as the enzyme PCSK9 in hypercholesterolemia, which we will discuss with our guests shortly. For now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Nabil Saida to our Beats radio program Thank you so much for participating with us today, Dr. Saida. Thank you, Dr. Khanna. To start, you're always, we're always fascinated and curious to know what shaped and directed our guest in choosing the field of science they operate in. Dr. Saida, what was your inspiration and motivation to enter the biochemical and, re and translational research field? Well, I grew up in Egypt uh, and I, uh, was confronted with family diseases since my youth, okay? Uh, I've had some people, some members of my family who had uh, cancer. Two of them died of that while I was growing. Uh, I've had members who had uh, schizophrenia and which we now know now it's schizophrenia. It was neurological diseases. So I was confronted with, and also the very poor uh, uh, situation in the streets of Cairo. And I saw diseases all the time. And at the same time, clearly at that time, there was no treatments. There were just palliative approaches. And I said to myself, maybe I can do something, you know, maybe, maybe just maybe, but I, knew, I, I realized that I have to learn a lot. You know, I knew nothing about the mechanism behind it and what do you, how do you handle this? Uh, and so where do you go? So at that time, we didn't have the, the web and everything like that. We had books, you know, and there was something called uh, Le, Le Dictionnaire Illustré, you know, mm. uh, which was a French dictionary, which illustrated all, it was done by hand, all how do diseases look like? How do people who have tumors look like? How do people who are twins look like? And so on, you know, and I was fascinated by this. And I said, my God, maybe I can learn from this, and of course, later on, I improved this learning, okay, and go somewhere. So I always, early on, at, when I was four, I, I realized that science is my field. But I didn't know which direction to go, and how do we handle this? So I happened to have very good professors who helped me, uh, to direct me towards what I really liked. And I moved to Cairo University at that time. This was the war, so it was a difficult time in my country. But I still wanted to learn. I was yearning to try to understand how uh, at that time there was different parts of biology. Electrochemistry was very interesting to me. And so I needed to go to neurobiology. So I realized that I have to go somewhere where I can handle uh, maybe how neurons work to help my, my, my grandmother and so on. And so I went for a PhD after my BSc to Georgetown University. Now I happened to be in a town where there was Vietnam War at the United States. It was a very troubling time for students. I mean, I was just a young student, didn't know what was going on. I saw a lot of people uh, demonstrating in the streets against the war, but at the same time, science was what attracted me. And so I decided to join a group that modeled how neurons work. I began to learn what is biophysics, what is mathematical modeling of disease. And that fascinated me. I said, maybe, maybe, just maybe, I can understand how do neurons transmit disease? How do you get Parkinson's disease? How do you get schizophrenia and so on? And so I, I got a PhD in, uh, in the chemistry department, but mostly applied to neuronal transmission. Once I finished that, uh, I uh, decided to come, to, I, I came to Canada 
because my family was there. And I joined the University of Montreal to try to improve my biophysical approaches to study how neurons work. And so I started to use electron spin resonance techniques, NMR, and so on, to try to understand better. And so as you can see, technology can drive where you're going. At that time, there was a new institute just being built, just built in Montreal. It was called the Clinical Research Institute of Montreal by Jacques Genet. And their interest at the time, and still is, was cardiovascular diseases. Okay? And, that, and the big buzz at the time was the kidney and uh, hypertension, because we, now, we knew at the time that the kidney was major. Uh, organ regulating hypertension. I said, wow. And then I met a man called Michel Chrétien, and he told me, look, I'm interested in the way proteins are activated. I didn't know anything about proteins. I was a mathematician. I was working on neuronal transmissions. He said, listen, you're going to learn about proteins, and you're going to help me try to understand how they get activated. I said, what do you mean, get activated? He said, well, you, you don't make insulin like that. If you want to get glucose metabolism, you need to cleave it, cut it from something called precursor or pro-insulin and make it. And at that time, he was interested in another hormone that was regulating your stress, which is cortisol regulation, ACTH. And he said, why don't you help me out? And maybe we will be able to figure out how does our body activate proteins? And this is where I entered the field and I'm in it since then. Uh, I started early, early on, within the first year, we discovered beta endorphin. Endorphin is a major player in pain regulation. My God, I'm entering in the neuronal field again, but now in terms of pain. And, and so on, we discovered a number of hormones this way by extracting uh, human pituitaries, human brain, as well as pig and sheep uh, uh, tissues. Try to understand how they get activated. So we isolated like a number of hormones, like about 10 of them. But the story remains, how do they get activated? What are the enzymes that activate it? So then we thought that maybe the heart would be the solution because the heart was, I was, I was in contact with some colleagues that told me the heart, you know what? The heart is not just a pump. It can actually secrete hormones and these hormones can be activated. I said, oh yeah? I said, yes. So what about helping us to identify the hormone first of all? So we, we had set up some new technology at that time. It was very new. It was called HPLC, okay, which now everybody uses. But we, we set it up. We had to have, we had like one meter columns. Now they're 10 centimeter now, you know. But at that time, we had to purify the hormones from the heart. And there was a group in Kingston who was also doing the same thing, the boat, you know. And I, I didn't know anything about the heart. I just learned, but I knew how to extract and I knew how to purify proteins, you know? So we happened to be almost neck to neck, identified atrial natriuretic factor, which is an important hormone that regulates blood pressure. Here we go, you know? And so again, how does it get made? Well, it's made by a precursor again. It's called pro-ANF. Ha, huh. so what, where does it get cut? It was in the atria of the heart. And I thought that maybe the heart would be the solution. Maybe I can pull, there's this big organ, I can get maybe enough of the enzyme that cut it. I failed miserably, you know? I went to the abattoirs here in Montreal because we sell our, our pigs to Japan and other countries. And I, and I myself, with my group, dissected 20,000 pig pituitaries ourselves. We would go to the abattoir and pull out these tissues and come back to the lab and rapidly extract them. We failed, okay? We, were not, we got a lot of new hormones but we never identified the enzymes. So I said, why? Well, why is it so difficult to identify them? Maybe we are wrong. Maybe we don't know how to do it. Or maybe there are so little of them that it will take tons to be able to, to identify them. So I decided to change approach, not to use the biochemical extraction approach, but now molecular biology was advancing and something new happened on the field. It's called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. It was just being invented, you know? I said, who, who, who's doing this, you know? So I happened to know a guy at the Pasteur Institute who had cloned renin involved in blood pressure regulation, you know? So I said, Francois, Francois Rougeon, he's called. He said, he said, why don't you come to my lab and make a sabbatical and maybe you'll help me out to understand uh, how does renin get activated? Because it's also activated by a precursor. I said, aha, this is good. And then you teach me molecular biology and I'll teach you how to extract proteins and to do enzymology. 
And I went there, spent the sabbatical year for one year at Pasteur, which was great, completely different environment. You go to lunch, you speak to so many people from different. I began to understand the importance of interdisciplinary approach, you know, that you don't have to be only in your field. You're going to have to learn people from all over the world. And so just over lunch, I probably spoke to at least hundreds of people, you know, in that year. And at that time, malaria was an important one. And people were looking for the enzyme implicated in malaria. And I, of course, working on these enzymes, I helped them out to isolate one of the enzymes of the malaria parasite. And they taught me PCR, which I didn't know anything about, you know. So coming back to Montreal after that, that one year, I said, what about using PCR, maybe, to pull out this difficult to isolate enzymes. So how do you do that? So I went skiing with a very known, uh, 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 at that time, uh, biochemist. I said, what do you think the enzyme is going to be? Because there were only four, uh, five different uh, uh, families of proteases. I said, which family is going to be? It's an old one. I mean, you can find it in dinosaurs. You can find it in many things. This must be a very old program. He says, yeah, it's going to be like blood coagulation factor. I said, okay, so I went to the you know, United States and I worked to the biggest lab that worked on blood coagulation factors. I said, well, why don't we try and find out if there is a blood coagulation factor that is implicated in the act activation of these hormones? So I isolated plasma calicrines and other things. Again, I failed, you know, I said there's something wrong. We're, we're not getting anywhere, you know, this is not the good approach. We finally, yeast, yeast is amazing. Uh, uh, you know, species that allow you to have, it's a relatively simple species, but you can manipulate it, you can do mutants. And so there was the group in California that realized that the first, and the yeast has a male and a female, if you want, it has a mating hormone for them to mate because they're, they're, they're you know, they deployed. And so to make that mating hormone, you needed an enzyme. And they used the yeast biology or the yeast, the power of yeast, uh, mutations to be able to identify the first processing enzyme called KEX2. I said, wow, this is it. Okay. They got the first one. And maybe in mammalian system, in human, we have the same. What about using PCR, which is this technology that I learned in Paris and so on, to try to what we call use um, oligonucleotides that have degenerate, you know, and maybe just pull it based on the Kexin structure. And just about that time, there was a group in Belgium that discovered they were interested in cancer and they were interested in a gene that was involved in cancer. And they thought that they had that gene, but I looked at this, I'm good at looking at sequence. I looked at the sequence, and said, oh my God, they're wrong. They thought it was an open reading frame. It was a, uh, uh, what we call an, uh, an exon, an, a, an intron, you know? and that there was non-coding. But when I translated it, I said, oh my God, it looks like a very similar sequence to the KEX2 of the yeast. It was a piece of it, you know? I said, huh, this is it. This, we got a human equivalent. They didn't know that. They just published, they thought they had the tumor stuff, you know? And I used PCR to pull this out, you know? I said, can we do it? And I used the heart because I thought I was smart. I was going to get the heart from where I put it. I failed in the heart, but I, I succeeded in the pituitary which makes many of the hormones, including beta endorphin and so on. And I isolated the first two enzymes called PC1 and PC2, and they turned out to be the major enzyme that make all the hormones that we know. And now the question was, how many enzymes are there? You know, so we, we bet champagne, you bet all types of things, you know. And to make a long story short, uh, over the years, we identified seven out of the nine known proprotein converters, including the one that you are interested in, PCSK9. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was a, an, an, a, a great way of, of remembering how the science developed over the past few decades. It's one piece at a time, something from France and something from the United States and something from Kingston. That's, that's how science is. And it is very important to remember. And nowadays, the focus on interdisciplinarity and multi uh, multi uh, group efforts is the way to do and progress science in, in any sort of direction forward. Um, so uh, let's talk more broadly about about this area of research. So, um, you know, when 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 you just uh, mentioned how you looked at, uh, you know, specific enzymes that are 
part of the, um, you know, uh, disease context in, in the heart and, you know, you mentioned the kidney and all of that. I wonder, what do you see as challenges or unique characteristics uh, found on the road uh, for clinical translation of basic and fundamental science research? Yeah. So, you know, out of 10,000 drugs that the ph pharmaceutical companies develop, maybe one makes it to the clinic. Okay, so it's a long road. Uh, it's a long road from going from uh, in vitro to the cell, to the animal, and finally to human, you know? Uh, you get all types of side effects, you get all types of problems, and that your gene may be doing many things that you don't know, you know? And that if you think you made a drug against that gene, you will get some side effects that you didn't expect. So we were extremely lucky with PCSK9 when we discovered it in 2002 and published it in 2003 early, you know? Again, this was not unexpected. It's always like this, you know, you, we're not going for a disease. We were going for a convertase, you know? We were trying to say, are there other members in the family? You know, that's all our interest was. And then we look at tissue distribution. And it turns out that the tissue distribution of this particular enzyme was relatively limited. It was the liver, it was a bit in the kidney and the gut. That's it, okay? So already it told us that maybe if we can get rid of it, uh, it won't cause so many side effects. We didn't know. And we knew that liver is a major source for cholesterol synthesis, you know, and cholesterol regulation, you know, as well as cleanup, if you want, of uh, undesired lipids. So we said, well, maybe it has to do with cholesterol. You know, we didn't know. Well, we, we happened to have uh, Jean Davignon at the Institute, who's the guru on lipoproteins in Canada, you know, and he told me, Nabil, you know what? I've been years trying to attract you to go into lipids. I said, I'm not interested in lipids. I'm interested in neurons, you know? He said, no, 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 this is quite interesting. I'm telling you, you have something maybe that will be working. I said, okay, if you're right, we will treat them with statins. Statins are those drugs that everybody, a lot of people take to reduce their cholesterol. If this is gonna be a cholesterogenic gene, it should be regulated by, by statins, and it was. So that was an eye opener. So I said, aha, uh -huh. so we've got ourselves a gene that is not distributed everywhere, that is rich in the liver, maybe regulating cholesterol. Who's interested in this? Now, things have changed, technology has changed, Google exists. So you go into Google and you say, is there anybody in the world interested in the liver? And I knew at that time it was chromosome 1P32, you know, this is the, or the localization of the gene. Is there anybody working on, on 1P32? Ah, there is this lady called Catherine Boileau in Paris, you know, and she's been working five years on this locus. She claimed at that time that there was another uh, gene there that somehow regulates hypercholesterolemia, different from the LDR receptor and APOB, the other two genes known. So I called her up. I said, listen, Katrina, I don't know you. You don't know me, but I have this story about PCSK9 at that time, call it NARC, but now we call it PCSK9. And I said, what do you think? You, you think it could be your gene? She said, ah, you're crazy. You know, I said, come on. You know, if you are right, if I'm right, you oh, you give me a bottle of champagne. This is France after all, you know? <laughs> she said, okay. So she started to look at all her patients. She had a fantastic cohort from both uh, 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 Bordeaux and Lyon. And she was able to very happily call me up a few, few weeks later. She said, you're right. All of the patients are mutants in PCSK9. You know, uh, whether we turned out to be gain of function mutant later on, you know? And we published our paper and she gave me three bottles of champagne, not one, you know? And we remain friends ever since. But this is how you get science. Now your question was, why would you choose this gene and not another? We are using others, and I'm gonna be discussing this on next Monday, which I think are also gonna be targets. The problem of, for example, the first two enzymes we found, PC1 and PC2, they make insulin, they make endorphin, they make uh, ACTH, they make all the hormones that we know. If you try to, inhibit them, you get all types of diseases. You get obesity, you get uh, neuronal problems. Uh, you know, you don't want to do that. So what are you going to do? Now, it turns out that now with technology, again, technology is very important. There is this new advantage of CRISPR. And CRISPR allows you to modify genes if ever somebody has a mutation. So this is going to be a game changer here now. You know, this is for the new future generation. They're going to have to use this technology quite a bit. You know, we had PCR, but now there are CRISPRs, you know? But you, they are not targets. If we, we made mice without PC1 or PC2 or, or both of them, they die or they have all types of problems. This is not solving disease. 
were as PC as K9 knockout, they looked fine. You know, they had no problem, the mice. In fact, they had very low cholesterol, you know. So you take another one, number eight, for example, the PCSK8, called, I call it ski one because we ski in Canada, you know. And, uh, and, and that one, if you knock it out, you don't even get an embryo. You don't want to do that. It's interesting in terms of biology, but it tells you that it does so many things. You don't want to touch this. So we now are now on to number seven. I think number seven is going to be the promising one, you know. The others are very interesting. Number four, for example, will regulate uh, all types of, uh, uh, you know, ability to, to regulate sperm, sperm production and sperm regulation. So that's, you could be using contraception if you want, you know. Fertility, but, yes, yeah. but right now, the only one that has really found its way to the clinic, uh, it's been PCS care. I'm now working on furin, very strongly, the number three, uh, and that because it's very heavily implicated in COVID-19. So I think it's going to be a very strong target there. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent segue into, into the next point I wanted to, to ask you about. So we know that worldwide statistics tell us that uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of mortality globally. Uh, what areas of research in your field would you identify to be of highest interest to the future contribution of basic research and translational efforts with regards to cardiovascular disease. Yeah, I know I'm in the Otto Heart Institute, you know, so of course <laughs> we have to talk about the CVDs, you know, even though I'm really working hard on it. So I think triglycerides are going to be the major ones, you know, hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, the cholesterol is now relatively well, I'm not saying people used to think in 2002 before we discovered PCS can I, that's it, we solve cholesterol, we have statins, what, there's nothing else to learn. Look, PCS can came and changed completely the, the field. Right now, as we see it, and it can change, triglycerides are gonna be a major game player. You know? uh, if you have too high glycerides, you get pancreatitis, uh, you get uh, uh, all types of inflammation, uh, obesity, uh, diabetes, and so on. So I think triglyceride regulation, there's a number of labs, including my own, okay, who are trying to regulate triglycerides in a way that is safe. So there are a number of trials going on with uh, antisense oligonucleotides as well as antibodies against angiopoietin like three, against uh, uh, you know, APOC3 and so on. And we are approaching it against PC7. So I think triglyceride is gonna be a major player in uh, cardiovascular disease. So I think we can contribute there. But there could be others in cardiovascular disease. I think inflammation is a major problem. And so there are now specific monoclonal antibodies uh, you know, against interleukin-1, against others, uh, which are implicated in inflammation. Uh, I think uh, Jean-Claude Tardif here at the, at the, at the Heart Institute, uh, he's also very much interested in colchicine, for example. Colchicine would regulate uh, you know, inflammation in myocardial infarct patients and so on. You know? So I think inflammation is a major player, okay? Uh, and that influences the production of all types of uh, free radicals, free, free oxygen radicals, and that will cause all types of disease. Yes, that is definitely uh, an area of interest that uh, even I and others at the Heart Institute do focus on uh, the inflammatory induced uh, heart diseases and the inflammatory driven heart disease uh, context. Uh, thank you so much for this, uh, Dr. Nabil Saida. We have one last question for you today. Mentorship is extremely valuable in shaping the direction of all individuals. What type of advice and words of wisdom would you like to share with trainees and early career scientists? First of all, um, you know, I gave maybe 500 talks in my life, you know. Uh, whenever a student asks me to give a talk, I really jump at the first thing because, first of all, they're younger, they're, they're much more enthusiastic, I'll come to, to what I think the importance of being that, that way. Uh, and so I accept it with pleasure. Uh, so, as you can see that science is not a one-way street. You know, it, it is, you have to be, first of all, you know what you're getting into. You're getting into something that is going to be long. It's a long way. Look, it took me 20 years to identify the convertases. You really have to believe in God when you're when in something like that, you know. And this is not going to happen by a press button stuff, you know. So how do you get there? You, you get there by reading a lot, by asking many good questions if you can, you know, listening to others because there are many others who have different ideas than yours and you can maybe learn from them. So I think enthusiasm, hard work, 
uh, make sure that you do not follow only one solution. There may be more than one solution to your problem. You have to choose the right mentor. I think it's important to, to, to select a person or a, you know, that can guide you because that's gonna be important when you make your PhD and others, you know, and later on will become a friend maybe, you know? Uh, and uh, so hard work, enthusiasm, believe in what you do. Always believe in what you do. Even though people will criticize you. People told me you're crazy. PCSK9 is not even an enzyme. Why would you work on it? Well, look what's happening now, you know? So if you believe you have something, pursue it, go for it, you know? Now you look at a tree, a tree would not happen if it didn't have roots, okay? I look at the roots as the fundamental knowledge. Without roots, you don't get a tree, okay? So without, uh, if you have the roots or if you have the mechanism by which you can create a tree, you can get a tree and flowers and whatever comes with it. So this is the, the translation application, if you want, of the roots. So I think always follow fundamental learning, understand the mechanism, and that's gonna be much later be useful sometimes, not always, huh? to have practical applications. So I think practical application is great, but if you do not have the fundamental knowledge, don't think you'll reach it in a way that you can, you can be lucky, you know, you can get a, a repurposed drug that have nothing to do, you know? But if you know the, the mechanism, I think it's much, much better. And you have to be ab able to work in groups, in teams. You have to be able to use interdisciplinary approaches. Never learn, be on one side. And always allow uh, for other people to bring their ideas and their, their models. You may be wrong, why not? You know, as long as you get to the truth, you want to find the truth, that's the idea, okay? And at the end, of course, you have to get funded for your research. So funding is a huge problem that we all know. Thank you so much for that. Uh, excellent words of advice, Dr. Saida. This concludes our interview. Once again, I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Nabil Saida, for the informative and fascinating talk with us regarding the translational and therapeutic potential of basic and fundamental research. On behalf of our director, Dr. Emilio Alarcon, our regular radio crew of Halle Arnett, Alex Ross, and myself, thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels, and we'll see you all soon again with another Science for the Community episode. Have a nice day. Thank you.